Um, yeah, I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at uh, RMES, but this is my first time presenting here, so it's, it's an, definitely an honor. And uh, in today's talk, I will give, uh, give a brief uh, look on the background on coastal flooding and green infrastructure. And I will introduce the research teams I'm interested in uh, and present the first part of my dissertation work, uh, the methods, uh, results, the implications and limitations of it. So let's start with the background. Even though they are inherently extremely uh, vulnerable to coastal hazard, natural hazards such as uh, to tsunamis, storm surges or strong wave action, coastal areas have always been important social and economic hubs throughout our history. Uh, it's not surprising that, that in 2014 approximately 44% of the global population uh, reside around the coastal areas. And similarly, most of the world's metro metropolitan areas also uh, locate within the 100 kilometers from the coastlines. And considering climate change and extreme events related to climate change, uh, the increase in coastal population represents uh, a big challenge for coastal communities. Climate change increases the hazards and their impacts coastal communities are exposed to. And the last few decades have already witnessed an escalating number of extreme climate events linked to these climate change stressors, such as changes in air and water temperatures, precipitation patterns, storm intensities, frequencies, and duration. Changes in the global and local sea levels are proven to be one of the most important contribu contributors to the impacts of weather-related events. It's because the sea level, uh, changes in the sea levels changes the tidal range and often increases the, the surface area water can reach and cause damage. And when we look at the North American context, we see that sea levels have been increasing uh, in pretty much all around North America, particularly in, um, in, in the heavily populated areas. So we know that climate change impacts are increasing. Uh, and particularly the increase in sea, level, sea levels uh, is expected to amplify the existing coastal flooding risks, coastal erosion risks, but also will impact the associated vulnerabilities in coastal areas. But how do we reduce the coastal flooding risks? Traditionally, this has been done by using hard structures so, uh, such as dikes and seawalls, but we know now through research and practice that these structures are very expensive to build to start with. They, are, they require really high maintenance. They are often very static. You cannot really move one to another location. Uh, they often cause erosion in other parts of the coastlines. And they create big wave over topping, toppings, which is usually the, the biggest part of the damage they cause, uh, as seen in this picture as well. Uh, but over, uh, in addition, the loose parts can also cause significant damage to human lives and infrastructure. Uh, they often serve a single purpose and uh, they tend to be not very aesthetically pleasing. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, green infrastructure comes into um, uh, get awareness uh, as a low cost, low alternative to these hard structures. They are often very adaptive to changing environmental conditions. They reduce erosion uh, either by accretion or binding soil properties. They often reduce uh, wave energy uh, in a gradual way, gradual way, so they don't have that uh, direct impact with the waves that create the wave overtopping. They often create essential uh, habitat for lots of species. Um, they provide multiple ecosystem services, and at least for me, they are very aesthetically pleasing. And what I mean by green infrastructure is uh, the dynamic coastal landforms such as barrier islands, uh, dune structures, or even gravel, woody, rocky beaches that naturally exist at the coast, or coastal vegetation, uh, not necessarily mangroves in this region, but seagrasses, dune vegetation, marshes, and even kelp forests. And also the reef systems that interact with the wave at the coast as well, such as mussel beds, oyster reefs, and coral reefs. Um, so I find green infrastructure is a very interesting field of st study and there are many ways of doing it as in any other fields of study. Uh, in my research I decided to tackle three parts of the green infrastructure research. In the first part I'm uh, undertaking a regional level study and I look at uh, how to identify green infrastructure uh, coastal protection benefits while accounting for its vulnerability as well. 
In the second team, I'm looking at, uh, I'm doing a local level study with the district of North Saanich, and I'm particularly looking at how we can use green infrastructure as a resilience building tool. And in the last team, I'm looking at the legal frameworks and inst institutional arrangements surrounding green infrastructure practices. And in this talk, I will focus mainly only on the first part of my dissertation work. And uh, there's a paper that is currently being reviewed by Stephanie. I'm hoping to submit it um, soon. Uh, and the second part, uh, I'm hoping to present it to you again in, in fall of 2007. So let's dive in with the first study. Um, there is now uh, pounding evidence uh, that the green infrastructure provides important coastal protection benefits to wave wave, uh, reducing wave energy, attenuating flood water, increasing elevation, which is called aggression, reducing erosion, and mitigating debris movement. However, we know that green infrastructure is also very vulnerable to changing environmental conditions. It's either due to changing climate-related uh, events or human action and sometimes inaction at the coast. Uh, so this vulnerability is very critical because it directly impacts cost, uh, uh, green infrastructure's coastal protection benefits. And what, it's <laughs> what is striking is that not a lot, actually not a lot of studies um, investigated this vulnerability in the same context with its coastal protection benefits. That's why my objective in this research is to develop a framework that can find communities with the highest green infrastructure coastal protection benefits while I account for its vulnerability as well. The main research question I ask here is how can a typology or a classification system identify patterns of green infrastructure coastal poten uh, potential coastal protection benefits as well as its vulnerability to, to changing environmental conditions? Uh, there are several sub-questions I'm also interested in this part is uh, for example, what parameters can be used to identify green infrastructure coastal protection benefits and vulnerability? What criteria can be used to organize these components in a meaningful way in a classification system? Uh, what special patterns of green infrastructure uh, vulnerability and coastal protection benefits can emerge in a study area? And how can this classification system be used to uh, help with regional decision making and knowledge sharing? Uh, the, f the study area of this project is the Selly Sea region, which uh, uh, hosts uh, the three important bodies of water, Strait of Georgia, uh, Juan de Fuca Strait, and Puget Sound. But it's also uh, host to the, the majority of the British Columbia and Washington state uh, communities as well, po uh, populations as well. Uh, in this research, I use coastal communities with populations over 4,000 were selected and 44 of them were from British Columbia and 30 from uh, Washington state made the cut. And I used several complementary uh, methods throughout this, this study. They include a literature review, a content analysis, creating green infrastructure database, um, developing and mapping the indices and also creating the green infrastructure typologies. So for the literature review, I used a well-known research database uh, and searched for green infrastructure studies in between 1970 to uh, 2015. I used several keywords to limit the search, and I ended up with 150 references that match my search criteria. Amongst that 151, uh, 77 of them contain specific parameters describing uh, green infrastructure's role in coastal protection and its vulnerability. Then I did a content analysis on the 77 references to identify the specific parameters, the measures they, they used in each study. And I recorded these parameters under, uh, I coded them and I recorded them under larger team groups. Uh, so the graph shown here, uh, here shows the parameter teams that were used uh, to, to measure certain properties of coastal protection benefits and also its, also its vulnerability, such as accretion, damages on human lives, green infrastructure characteristics, green infrastructure cover, land use at coast, monetary damages, sea level change, sedimentation, site morphology, soil properties, tidal range, water depth, 
and wave characteristics. And as you can see, some of them actually uh, were used much more than the other ones. Uh, and some of them were used um, less frequently in the studies. Um, after identifying the main parameters, um, I created a green infrastructure database. And out of the 13 parameters I just mentioned, I was able to find data for nine of them. And I know this table looks crowded, but I will uh, look more in detail in a bit. Uh, so the left side of this table shows the parameter teams that I was able to find data for. So there are nine of them out of 13. And uh, the, the middle section of this table shows their corresponding uh, indicators for each parameter team. And the, and the last column shows the data sources. So look more closely, for example, for site morphology, I was able to find data for relief and coastal types. And for wave characteristics, I was able to find data for wave exposure, maximum wave height, and maximum wave fetch indicators. Uh, later, I had to drop the sedimentation indicator uh, because the data was not usable. So at the end, I ended up with eight parameter teams and 11 corresponding indicators. Uh, afterwards, I used the, these 11 indicators to create green infrastructure, coastal protection, and uh, green infrastructure vulnerability indices. To organize the indices and compute their, uh, their scores, I applied the methodology that was developed by Gornis et al. in 1989. Uh, and this methodology is actually known as coastal vulnerability index. Some of you might be familiar with it. This methodology was also used by CANCOS in Canada and USGS in United States and some other platforms as well. What this methodology means is that I applied a rule-based rule method and ranked the indicators, indicator values from uh, one very low to five very high. Uh, and afterwards, I applied the CV formula uh, to compute their scores, which is the score root of the geometric means. Uh, divided by the total number of variables. Um, so this is what the Green Infrastructure Coastal Protection Index looks like. And based on this classification, um, you will see on the right side, um, Green Infrastructure's Coastal Protection benefits would be at the highest where the coastal relief is high. The coastline consists of material that provides high, high roughness. The vegetation at the coastline interacts with the wave action and the habitat locates in the higher sections of the tidal range and the wave exposure, wave height and the wave fetch are low and the land use at coast consists mostly of green users. And then this index was applied to my study area communities. And first thing to see here maybe, uh, especially in, well, the, the difference in between British Columbia and Washington state, and we can say that the green infrastructure in British Columbia tends to have higher coastal protection benefits. However, when we look at the high population centers such as Vancouver, Richmond, North Vancouver, and Victoria, we see that the green infrastructure in these locations seems to not have uh, such high coastal protection benefits. Then um, I did a similar approach with the coastal vulnerability index, and based on this, um, green infrastructure's vulnerability is high if the relief and the tidal range is low, the habitat is located at the lower parts of the tidal range, sea level change uh, is high, and the coast is erosional and exposed to high wave action, and uh, the land use at the coast consists mostly of commercial and residential users. After the indicators were ranked and computed and applied to the study area communities, we see, of course, a little bit of a different scenario than the first map. Uh, previously, we seen that some of the uh, Vancouver Island communities, uh, the green infrastructure seemed to be uh, providing high coastal protection benefits, but that has changed. Again, we see some of the high population centers, um, in green infrastructure in these places being uh, more vulnerable. And um, something to keep in mind is like uh, Richmond, uh, sorry, Delta and Surrey here uh, are classified under very low vulnerability. And I just would like to uh, make a remark about it. We, when we talk about vulnerability, we often talk about 
social vulnerability. So I want you to change that view. This is not the, the social vulnerability. We are looking at the vulnerability of the environment there. And the reason uh, why these places were classified under very low vulnerability is because they do have higher tidal range and the habitat locates in the higher part of the tidal range. The, the coastal land use is much further from the coastline, so which gives uh, the vegetation um, enough space to move backwards and forwards. And uh, the erosion rate is also low compared to the other places as well. Um, then I, you, uh, then I merge these two uh, indices in a two by two matrix to create the green infrastructure typologies. And uh, type one here will refer to uh, high vulnerability and low protection benefits, so not really the ideal scenario. And type two would, uh, sorry, type four will be the ideal scenario where coastal protection benefits are high and vulnerability is low. But for the sake of this presentation, let's call them not good, can be better, good enough, and ideal. Um, that makes it a little bit easier, I think. Uh, then I uh, apply this typology to my study area communities, uh, which reveal that the big population centers in British Columbia, again, uh, such as Vancouver, Victoria, North Vancouver, and Richmond fall under not good to can be better categories suggesting that green infrastructure may not be the most appropriate course of coastal protection action for these communities. Um, or they could pro potentially invest in more hybrid uses of green infrastructure. And Washington State has also more not good and can be better communities which also suggest that they can concentrate their efforts uh, more in uh, either retrofitting the existing infrastructure or coastal rehabilitation projects, um, ways to accommodate occasional flooding or even limiting new coastal development to non-essential uses. About 60% of the communities in British Columbia are under good enough or ideal categories which suggest that there's a big potential in the region. Um, on the other hand, this is only about 36% in Washington state. Um, so limit, uh, for, for these communities, uh, beach nourishment, again rehabilitation, but more site-specific investigations would be a good course of action where they can really do more specific invest investigations to see how they can uh, utilize these uh, important resources at their coastlines. So I believe this research uh, and its findings have four main implications. First, uh, this is the first of its kind where the cost of protection and vulnerability were accounted together. Uh, second, it is useful for multiple levels of uh, governance in terms of resource allocation, prioritization of the projects uh, or funding or so on. Third, um, it helps the knowledge sharing in the region. Communities can learn from each other and co can actually foster collaboration of communities within the area. And last, the methodological framework can be applied to different scales and different regions as well. It could be applied to a very neighborhood scale, uh, to very uh, large national scale as well. However, I do believe that this research has equal number of uh, limitations. Uh, but, and I will be happy to hear your perspective uh, on how to overcome some of these as well. To start with, I think this work, uh, this work accounts for vulnerability, but it doesn't really explain how that vulnerability would impact the coastal protection benefits. Second, the data availability restricts the use of the indicators, but I do see is being a very common uh, issue with indicator-based uh, research, uh, but an important point nevertheless. And uh, third, the, the Gornis methodology used here is potentially one of many that could be applied to this work. But it's very difficult to determine at this point whether or not uh, if it's the best. Uh, and lastly, the regional scale of this assessment oversees some of the localities that can be very crucial in determining what type of coastal protection communities will like to use. Um, for example, in places like uh, not good category, they can actually uh, have some patches of green infrastructure in their coastlines that can be uh, utilized if, if treated uh, correctly. 
Um, but overall, I think uh, this research uh, adds important parts, uh, in term, both in terms of methodology, um, but also in terms of knowledge to the field of green infrastructure. Uh, there's still yet uh, many things to discover, so if you want to do a PhD on it, uh, I will be happy to chat. Uh, I would like to thank to my committee members, Stephanie, Mark and Megan, uh, my lab members, Jackie, Michelle, Christopher, Rebecca, and Bas as well, and my founders, Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, MIOPAR, and Public Scholars Initiative. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, they, you can do it. Um, the reason I didn't do it is because it was a regional level study and uh, those type of weighting, especially in this context, is really depending on community specific needs and uh, the, the natural environment the community is dealing with. But uh, I think there is room in this methodology that you can apply a weighting uh, as well. Yeah, it could be, uh, for, like I wouldn't do it in a regional uh, scale, uh, but if I would to do it, I would interview uh, probably uh, the, the main regional governments here, like Capital Regional District, Metro Vancouver. Um, I think also uh, the east of Vancouver Island has its own, and there's Island Trust. Those will be places to interview, or you could potentially interview the provincial government as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I will remember to uh, repeat your question. So, what about the cost of green infrastructure? Uh, isn't isn't that something to consider? Uh, was Kai's question? It is. Uh, I do not put specifically get into cost in this project, but I did read a lot about uh, the cost of green infrastructure versus hard structures. It could be somewhere between 40 to 60 percent cheaper than traditional hard structures if it is applied into uh, a location that that is not really absurd. Like if if the location is not a cliff and you are trying to put like salt marshes there or something like that. If it's applied in in a right context, it could be 40 to 60 percent cheaper than traditional hard structures. There has been a lot of research done in this region by Green Shores, which is a BC stewardship group, and they did hire several con consultants. Like the John Richa is one of the biggest one in this region. They did specific studies for British Columbia, and they did come up with the similar numbers uh, in terms of cost efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. um, it could be. Um, I was wondering um, it's how to collect data about it. Uh, it could be a challenge. Um, I, I do see it again uh, in, in a more local context with, with if you are working with the local government uh, people and on the site, you will have more chance to learn about the cost of the, the, the green infrastructure taking space. In a regional level study, um, I don't really, um, like the, the parameters I use, such as the vegetation or like the coastal type, they are more linear. They don't really go into the, the, the depth of the coastline that is occupied. So in a regional scale, I do see it a little bit uh, difficult to integrate. But again, in a local scale, um, it could be added as an indicator for sure. Uh, but I actually never seen a study that looked at, and even the cost-effective study, studies that I, I looked at, they didn't really include the amount of space green infrastructure takes and what's its implication to the cost. So I think it will be an interesting field to study, nevertheless. Yeah, yeah Gazelle. 
So the question is about uh, the public perception of green infrastructure and if uh, communities would like to implement uh, such tools. Uh, it's a great one and it's actually one of my favorite things to talk about. Uh, <laughs> because I find it really interesting. Uh, in terms of uh, policy makers, uh, they tend to not really favor green infrastructure because it's not really tangible to them. They, don't, they cannot really visualize what it will look like or they cannot really see something strong standing in front of the water and like prevents water from coming up. Uh, and the same type of uh, idea uh, resonates in the community as well. In my second part of my research, I'm working with North Saanich and I did two public meetings so with them so far and uh, people don't think that vegetation can uh, do attenuate water. They, they don't really think that and I did ask them in the surveys and once you actually show them examples and uh, educate them a little bit more then their, their perceptions tend to increase a lot. The most helpful was another member in the community uh, addressed the, the rest of the community members and said she said that she planted uh, native salt tolerant vegetation at the edge of her property which was occasionally flooding and she saw in two years that her land start like going up and like this actually helped more to the community to understand the impacts of vegetation than me trying to tell them like it's actually good it does this much good there like eight you can uh, get 80 percent of er erosion protection this much percent of wave attenuation so her saying that, giving that example was actually much more than what I could have done. Uh, but the initial perspective is actually very negative, like they don't think it could work. Uh, but it's, it's growing, it's definitely 